Well, Battleground might have been a bowl of shit, but Raw and SmackDown were bowls of ice cream. What is up? Good mic work. Commentaries back at you with episode 446. I'm your host, Greg Morgan. Up here as promised with your Raw and SmackDown review for July 24th and 25th, 2017. And really, that's all we're going to get into. I didn't really see too much other news to talk about at the end of this commentary, so it's probably just going to be a lot of chatter and a lot of discussion about all of the storylines on Raw and SmackDown currently. And I gotta say, they both really bounced back from a shitty pay-per-view on Sunday night. I think we can all agree that Battle ground, like I said in the opening, was a bowl of shit. Literally a bowl of shit. It was horrible. Easily the worst pay-per-view of 2017 so far. And for us to tune in on Monday night and watch a different brand in Monday Night Raw, have a great show, and then SmackDown really bounce back with a solid show on Tuesday, I'm willing to let it go as far as Battleground is concerned. I mentioned that in my Battleground results video. If you haven't seen that video, it's right up there in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Just click the cards there, and you can check that out. But I wasn't too kind to that pay-per-view, and I was giving it a lot of shit because I did feel like it was awful. But I also said that that's what we have to expect from the WWE when they're giving us 15 or whatever pay-per-views per year. They're not not all going to be home runs and they're going to give us some crappy ones and that's been the norm for years. So really it's something that I can accept especially during the build of some of these pay-per-views. You can tell they're going to suck and sometimes the only thing that saves them is really good efforts by the talent or really good matches or great matches that we didn't expect to be great or basically the talent pulling through and making a lackluster card turn into a great pay-per-view. We've seen that from SmackDown before. We've seen it from Raw before. So I'm really not all that pissed about Battleground. I mean, how great did you expect the Punjabi prison match to be anyway? You know, for me, I kind of got exactly what I expected out of that main event and out of the pay-per-view in general. So for me, it wasn't that big a deal. For me, it wasn't enough to question my loyalty to professional wrestling or whether or not I should be a fan anymore. Every time a pay-per-view like this happens, you have fans talking about that they're not going to watch WWE anymore. They're just going to distance themselves from wrestling because it sucked so bad. WWE always has a way of bouncing back from a shit show or a shitty pay-per-view. We've seen this multiple times in the past where we've hated a Raw or SmackDown, but then they come back and give us a great one the following week. So wrestling has its ups and downs just like it always does. And when WWE gives me a shitty pay-per-view, it's not enough for me to just to say, oh, I'm not going to watch wrestling anymore because if you stay tuned, WWE is likely to bounce back with some good shit. And they definitely did on Monday and Tuesday. So we're going to start with Raw first because a lot of interesting things happened on Raw and it was a really good show, especially that opening segment. I swear that opening segment was better than the entire pay-per-view of Battleground. We had Kurt Angle coming out to address the situation from last week when Braun Strowman showed up and sabotaged the Samoa Joe and Roman Reigns number one contenders match. He came out there and beat the shit out of both of them. This week, Kurt Angle is out there to announce what he has decided to do for SummerSlam and who's going to face Brock Lesnar. Well, everybody comes out there, Roman Reigns, Braun Strowman, Samoa Joe, they're all cutting promos on each other, and the only thing I didn't like about this, as great as the segment was, Roman Reigns tried to murder Braun Strowman at Great Balls of Fire. Braun Strowman got a little bit of revenge last week when he came out there and interrupted Roman's number one contenders match, but really... On the surface, these two guys in storyline should hate each other. They should not be able to stand there in the ring and cut promos with each other. They should immediately start fighting, or Braun should be the monster that he's claiming to be. And as soon as he sees Roman Reigns, he grabs him by the throat because Roman tried to kill him just a few weeks ago. So the only thing I didn't like about this segment is that Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns were in the ring cutting promos instead of fighting. Their rivalry has too much history and too much heat, I believe, for the two of them just to stand there flapping their gums at each other. They should be pulling out machetes and trying to cut the other one's head off. But luckily, the peace would not last long because Kurt Angle eventually, after everybody says their peace and states their case as to why they should be the ones to face Brock, Kurt Angle makes the much-anticipated fatal four-way main event. We kind of thought that that was the direction they were going in, especially after last week. And a lot of us have been seeing this match coming for weeks now. So the fact that Kurt Angle made that fatal four-way wasn't that big of a surprise, but it was still awesome. I have no problem with that. I mentioned that right from the start. I didn't care what they did. I'm really happy with the top contenders right now on Raw. Yes, they're all big and they're all bad, but that's just the current phase WWE's going through. I'm sure some smaller guys like Finn Balor will 
get their opportunities in the future. But right now, you got a big beast in Brock Lesnar. He needs to face big beast opponents. And he's going to get three of them at SummerSlam. And this is a beefy main event, but it's also one that I think could be very good. As big as these guys are, they're all extremely capable in the ring. And they all have different styles. And I think these four big men can actually make some magic at SummerSlam. I'm going out on a limb and saying that their match is going to be good because the brawl on Monday night, once this was all decided, by the way, Samoa Joe gets very pissed and yells at Kurt Angle. And Kurt Angle's like, hey, the decision's made. Talk amongst yourselves. And he gets out of the ring. And then the three guys proceed to brawl with each other and have a great fucking fight. And Braun Strowman, of course, is just annihilating everybody. A whole bunch of security guards run out there. And he's just mowing them all over. He throws, he tosses one guy so far over the top rope that had the crowd been there, he would have landed in the first or second row. I mean, he tossed him right into the rampway. And uh, whoever that developmental kid was took a sick bump. The locker room then empties out. And it's this big pull apart. The entire WWE Raw roster is out there trying to separate these three monsters. And we are actually going to see a triple threat match next week on Raw between the three of them. And that's a match I thought they might save for the go-home show. I expected that triple threat match to happen, but not right away on Raw next week. So that kind of surprised me. But that segment, that brawl between the three of them, without Brock even being there. Brock wasn't even in the building. He wasn't even involved in the segment at all. And it was that good without him. Imagine how good it's going to be at SummerSlam. So... I think that, yes, all four of these guys are big, but this is not King Kong Bundy versus Earthquake versus Bam Bam Bigelow versus Giant Gonzalez. These are four guys that can fucking go in there, and I think they're going to put on a really good brawl at SummerSlam, and now you have to start speculating on who they're going to put the title on. You know who my early pick is? You know who I think absolutely must walk out of SummerSlam with the belt? That's Braun Strowman. I mean, look at him, this monster. I mean, he has completely bounced back from that bullshit loss that he suffered at the hands of Roman Reigns way back at Fastlane. I thought that was a big mistake to beat him like that, and I was hoping that he would be able to recover from it, and he did. Defeating Roman Reigns in a couple of matches on pay-per-view, surviving attempts made on his life, I mean, this guy is truly a beast, and I think now, in the position that he's in, you got to put the title on him in this situation. He can pin Roman Reigns, he can pin Samoa Joe, they can get the belt off of Brock without having to beat Brock and get the title back as a main part of Monday Night Raw because Brock's been at home with that belt ever since WrestleMania. We don't have a world title really defended on Raw at all. So we need a champion back on the main roster, back working full time. And if you are going to put Brock in a fatal four way, if you ever want to get the belt off of him without harming Brock, this is where you do it. So I don't ever want to guarantee anything because I know WWE can change their mind at a drop of a hat. But right now, you've got to think that Brock Lesnar is going to drop that belt at SummerSlam to somebody. And I think considering how big they've built Braun Strowman all the time and energy and effort they put into his push, to have him lose here, especially when he's in a fatal four-way situation, he can beat somebody without having to totally bury him and all that bullshit that you can get away with in a fatal four-way. This is where you put the belt on him. Have him go out there and just destroy everybody. He can annihilate Roman Reigns, annihilate Samoa Joe, really give Brock a run for his money, maybe knock him out of the match and somehow get a pin over Joe or Reigns to win the belt. And then Brock can go back at home. We got the belt back on Monday Night Raw. He can have matches with Samoa Joe or Roman Reigns at future pay-per-views. And you can let Braun run with it for a while, maybe until Survivor Series. And he has a rematch with Brock, and we get that big one-on-one match between the two. If they put the belt on one of the other two guys, Joe or Reigns, I don't know how much sense that would make at this point. I don't mind Samoa Joe being Universal Champion. I'd have no problem with that at all. I just right now don't see them doing that. They could. We have a long way before we get to SummerSlam. So I'm not saying Joe doesn't have a chance to win the belt. I just don't think they're going to do that. And with Roman Reigns, I don't see them putting the belt on him either in this type of a match, in a fatal four-way type of a match. I thought originally, way back in January, that the plan was for Roman Reigns to go into WrestleMania and beat The Undertaker and then eventually dethrone Brock at SummerSlam even defeating Braun Strowman once along the way. So I had predicted that way back in January, but that didn't happen now. Now we're looking at a fatal four-way type of situation. And with WWE, the way they push Roman Reigns, the way he defeats everybody one-on-one completely clean like he did to The Undertaker, if he's going to win that Universal title, 
I think he would win it in a one-on-one straight-up match. So maybe you have Braun win it at SummerSlam, and then maybe Roman takes it off of him. Because think about it. Yes, Roman Reigns beat Strowman way back at Fastlane, but Braun Strowman came back and beat him twice on pay-per-view. Beat him on Raw, I think. Now he wins the WWE title at SummerSlam. Now you've built up Braun Strowman enough to where if Roman takes the belt off of him, you're not burying Braun Strowman. So I think Braun Strowman, from where I sit nearly a month away from SummerSlam, he's my early pick to win the title because he's just the guy that makes the most sense. So I'm rooting for Strowman all the way in this match. I hope he comes out of this match with the title because now you've got another big star that you've created, that you've built. SmackDown's been doing this a lot. Raw needs to get their act together and do the same thing. They put the belt on Kevin Owens last year. So why not Braun Strowman? Think about what he's done. He's defeated Roman Reigns, the guy that retired The Undertaker, a three-time former WWE champion, their new poster boy. Not only did he defeat Roman Reigns a few times, he survived Roman Reigns' best shot, which was the ambulance and semi-truck deal at Great Balls of Fire. And you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but does Raw get the Hell in the Cell pay-per-view that's usually in October? If that's going to be their show, I see Roman Reigns versus Strowman in the cell for the title. I mean, to me, that's the next obvious step to take, especially if Braun Strowman does win the title at SummerSlam. So right now, he's my early pick. He's who I'm rooting for. And uh, yeah, I hope Braun Strowman hangs on to the belt and even survives a couple of matches with Joe and Roman Reigns and maybe eventually has a one-on-one match and confrontation with Brock Lesnar at a big pay-per-view like Survivor series or like Royal Rumble. So that's kind of where I, I see them going, but who knows what the hell's in WWE's head. But I, uh, I couldn't be happier with the Fatal 4-Way. I'm totally fine with that, especially if it leads to a world title run for Strowman and it gets the belt off of Brock and puts it back on Raw where it belongs instead of Brock's bedroom in Canada, then I'm a happier wrestling fan. So that's what I'm rooting for right now. I'd love to hear all of your opinions. Just leave them in the comments below and tell me what you think. We had Finn Balor taking on Elias Sampson in a no disqualification match, and I want to stand corrected on something. Last week, I was bitching about the guitar shot that Finn Balor took from the Drifter during their match. And it was weird because I was kind of on Twitter chatting with some of you. I had the show on and I was watching it, but I wasn't like that focused on the Drifter and Balor match. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, out of nowhere, Drifter just explodes this guitar over Balor's head. Terrible shot. He kind of misses, hits him on the shoulder and and the side of the guitar cut Finn Balor's head, and I was a little bit pissed. I'm like, was that fucking necessary just because you're in Tennessee that you have to hit somebody with a guitar and potentially hurt somebody the way Balor was busted open? And I found myself just being annoyed with the spot because I didn't think it was necessary. Finn Balor, I thought, was going to move on to face Bray Wyatt in a big program and probably a SummerSlam match. What was the point of the Drifter doing that to Balor to get disqualified? They could have had the Drifter get disqualified a number of ways without risking the health of one of their wrestlers. To me, it was just an unnecessary guitar shot that wouldn't lead to anything, but it did. It led to a no DQ match on Raw, and it was awesome. It was a really good match. It lasted a couple of different commercial breaks. I watched nearly the whole thing. I thought it was a really good outing for Elias Sampson, and I found myself enjoying the match even though it was incredibly predictable. About two minutes into the match, I had tweeted that the Drifter is going to get the victory because Bray Wyatt's going to interfere and help him, right? That just seems obviously what they're going to do, and that's what they did. So even though it was really predictable, I didn't care. I enjoyed the match. I thought Sampson looked really good. And then the finish saw the lights go out. Bray Wyatt shows up, hits Finn Balor with the sister Abigail. The Drifter gets the win and leaves the ring. So it gives him a victory and it furthers the storyline between Bray Wyatt and Finn Balor. And then Wyatt is in the ring with Balor who's laid out after the loss and he does that weird backwards crab walk thing. And I'm like, oh man, wait until the demon comes face to face with Bray Wyatt. I really like that the WWE took their time bringing the demon back with Finn Balor. I mean, last year they debuted it almost right away. I think he came out on Raw and beat Roman Reigns in that number one contenders match first as regular Finn Balor, but the next week he was out as the demon confronting Seth Rollins and wrestled as the demon at SummerSlam. So for them to hold this off and for them to continue to build this issue between Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt, at some point Finn Balor's going to say, hey, you know what, Bray Wyatt? You want to get nuts? Fine, let's get nuts. There's somebody I'd like you to meet and come out as the demon. I think it's going to be great shit, and I think it's going to be a really fun attraction action match at SummerSlam when you have these two very crazy characters coming face to face. I'm excited for the feud. You know, I mentioned how bored I was with Wyatt and Rollins. This, I think, can be a lot better. So I have high hopes for Finn Balor and Bray Wyatt, and I do want to stand corrected and apologize to anybody I might have pissed off for uh, being mad about the guitar shot last week. It actually did serve a purpose. It led to a great match on Raw, gave Elias Sampson a victory, and furthered one of WWE's top storylines. So I take back everything
everything I said about the guitar shot last week. Uh, we had Cass beating Enzo in a match. They fought, faced each other one on one backstage. Big Show is trying to give Enzo a pep talk and basically admires his guts to go out there and basically just get annihilated. And this is kind of funny too because after Cass is done beating Enzo, he continues the assault, which prompts the Big Show to come out to make the save. And Cass picks up Enzo and grabs him by the neck like Zeus used to do back in 1989 and grabs Enzo by the head and tells Big Show that if he puts one foot in that ring, he's going to snap his neck. What the fuck is going on here? You have attempted murder at Great Balls of Fire. Now you've got Cass threatening to kill somebody on live TV. So why are Roman Reigns and Cass not in jail? How many times have we seen police officers show up and put WWE stars in the back of cop cars? I think Cass and Roman should be taking a ride in one of those things together. We had a really good women's number one contender match on Raw as well between Bayley and Sasha Banks. The winner of that is going to face Alexa Bliss at SummerSlam. And Bayley beats Sasha in a great match. That kind of surprises me, especially what WWE has done to Bayley in recent months. Maybe they want to make this a full circle type of deal for her to where she is champion at the beginning of the year, is champion at WrestleMania, and then hits a huge decline but stays positive and is able to build herself back up and win back the title at SummerSlam, I guess would make for a cool kayfabe story or whatever. But I was kind of surprised that she beat Sasha Banks. I thought Sasha might win that. But now we're going to get Bayley and Alexa again at SummerSlam, a match we've already seen a couple of times. And unless Bayley is able to right all of the wrongs from earlier this year, what's the point of this match unless you do some kind of a heel turn? Maybe Sasha goes heel... At SummerSlam, I think SummerSlam would be the best place for that instead of doing it on Raw, although I have a feeling they're going to do it on Raw. But maybe if they want to hold it off until SummerSlam, Sasha can run in during the Alexa and Bayley match and cost Bayley the match, turn heel on her, beat the shit out of her, keeps the belt on Alexa, and you got a whole new feud between Sasha Banks and Bayley, uh, heel versus babyface. That could be what they're doing there. Uh, so I guess right now, I don't know. I think there's too, mu- there's too much time between now and SummerSlam for me to try to predict this accurately. But, you know, it's probably going to be one of those two scenarios. Scenarios, Bailey will either lose because of a Sasha heel turn, whether that comes before SummerSlam or at SummerSlam, or Bailey wins the belt and redeems herself from all the shit WWE put her through earlier this year. So I guess either way, I don't care as long as the match is good. I thought the number one contenders match was awesome on Raw, and even though I was surprised that Bailey won, I didn't care. I really don't care. Next up, we're going to talk about Jason Jordan. Now, I gave my opinions last week on how horrible I felt this storyline was. Revealing Jason Jordan to be Kurt Angle's son, I thought was the stupidest fucking thing. And like Jim Cornette says, it got over like a fart in church. Nobody cared. The fans were completely quiet. The whole thing was cheesy. It was hokey. It was stupid. It was a letdown. It was every possible negatively descriptive word you can think of. I mean, I completely hated this angle. But then I thought about it a little bit more. And I watched what we saw on Monday Night Raw, and it got me thinking, you know what? This actually can be okay if they write this properly. And I had a couple of ideas I was tweeting about, and one of those big ideas is something that I touched on last week in my commentary, and that is eventually Jason Jordan turning heel and facing his father, Kurt Angle. So on Raw, we see this horrible interview with Jason Jordan. He's smiling, he's happy, he says all the right things. He's about as babyface as you can be. He is more puke-inducing than The Rock was when he came in as Rocky Maivia in 1996. I mean, a horrible interview. The fans were literally silent. And that Jason Jordan on the mic, I never see being a major star in the WWE. However, the Jason Jordan in the ring is a completely different person. He saved that terrible interview when he got in the ring. And It's not like I've never seen Jason Jordan work before. I've seen plenty of his matches, but I don't think I was really realizing how badass he really is. I mean, he was tossing around Kurt Hawkins. He had a mean streak. He was just picking him up and slamming him down. I mean, I can see this guy working heel. I think he would be great. And even at the end of the match, he pulls down the straps just like Kurt Angle did. I'm surprised he didn't use the angle slam or the ankle lock for his finisher. I was also curious about his theme music. I thought maybe he would come out to Kurt's music. And I was also wondering if he was going to get new music or if he was going to share music with Chad Gable, or if Chad Gable was going to get new music on SmackDown. I really didn't know what they were going to do, but Jason Jordan came out there to his American Alpha music. Maybe they're going to wait and change it when he turns heel and have him use this for now. So when I start thinking about the heel turn that really should happen with this guy, because you can see he's got that killer instinct. He looks like a killer. He throws you around in there. He's very physically menacing, and he's good, and he can just beat the shit out of you. But unfortunately, this smiling baby face, this proud, happy son, is just not going to get over character-wise, but his work in the ring is. So what I would like to see happen is for them to reveal that Jason Jordan was never Kurt Angle's son. 
Maybe somebody is involved. Maybe Triple H and Stephanie paid off Jason Jordan to fabricate this whole story in order to humiliate and destroy Kurt Angle. And don't forget about that certain announcer that's had his nose in this thing from the beginning, Corey Graves. What if Corey Graves was behind this? It was Corey Graves that initially showed Kurt Angle that first text message to begin with. This could have been a whole collaboration with Jason Jordan and Corey Graves. Maybe Jason Jordan is going to go heel and Corey Graves can weasel his way into the Raw general manager spot. Maybe maybe Jason Jordan has a match. Maybe Kurt Angle finds himself in some sort of a conflict and his general managership is put on the line in a match between Jason Jordan and somebody else. And Jason Jordan turns heel and loses the match. Kurt is no longer GM. Corey Graves gets put into that position and it was revealed that this was all a big plan to get Corey Graves as the GM on Raw. He was behind this whole thing. So I think either Corey Graves or Triple H or Stephanie being behind Jason Jordan fabricating this story is the way to go here because I don't like it when they try to pretend people are fathers and sons and brothers and all this stuff. Yes, I know it's wrestling. I know we're supposed to suspend our disbelief, but it's a little bit easier to suspend your disbelief when there's at least some reality sewn in there. And there's absolutely none with this Jason Jordan and Kurt Angle storyline. So if it comes out that Jordan was never his son and he only used this story as a way to get himself over it, a way to get himself opportunities and championships and become a major player in WWE. It's a win-win for Jason Jordan and it's a win-win for Corey Graves if it turns out to be him behind this. And it's a win-win for Triple H and Stephanie if it turns out that they're behind this. But whatever they do, I kind of see them going in that direction. They have to. And if they do, I will also stand corrected on me shitting all over this Jason Jordan being Kurt Angle's son idea. Because at first, I definitely envisioned a match between the two of them, but it didn't really dawn on me that this whole thing could be fabricated and Jason Jordan could just be playing a role here, working Kurt Angle, making him believe that he's his son and completely destroying Kurt Angle, not only emotionally, but maybe even physically, if he ends up fucking him up at some point. So I'm going to sit back and stop bitching about this Jason Jordan and Kurt Angle storyline, at least for right now, and see where it goes. Because when I see Jason Jordan in the ring, he is too much of a badass to have him out there acting like Rocky Maivia in 1996. This has got to lead to more than that for him. WWE's had this guy in mind for years, way back in NXT, way back in developmental, before he even really hooked up with Chad Gable. He looked like somebody that could be a WWE champion in the next 5 to 10 years. So I have really changed from being completely disgusted with this angle to being slightly optimistic about it. So hopefully... We will see more next week, and we will. Jason Jordan is going to be the guest on Miz TV. And this will tie into the main event of Raw, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But when I see Jason Jordan advertised for Miz TV, that means only one thing. Intercontinental title match at SummerSlam. What else could it be? He'll come on Miz TV next week. He'll be this happy baby face. The Miz will insult him. Jason Jordan will kick his ass. And Kurt Angle will make an Intercontinental title match at SummerSlam. And then The Miz will accuse Kurt Angle of giving his son preferential treatment. He's like, no, you're the one that attacked him and called him a piece of shit, so I'm making the match or whatever. You know it's going to happen some way like that. And that kind of surprises me because I thought the Intercontinental title was going to be penciled in for Seth Rollins. But it looks like another belt is going to be in his future. So putting Jason Jordan with The Miz right now, giving him an IC title match at SummerSlam, giving him the belt, start building his legacy on Raw, I think is probably the right move because if they do turn Jason Jordan heel and it is revealed that this whole thing was a big ruse, it's something that I think they can't drag on for too long. They can drag it on for a little while, but I don't think you can go till the end of the year on this. I think this needs to happen no later than November. Because eventually the fans are going to sniff this out, they're going to see it coming, and uh, you don't want to telegraph it too much. So Jason Jordan not being Kurt Angle's son, making up this whole thing to get himself opportunities, and Corey Graves or maybe another party being involved is the way I think they should go here. And I think Jason Jordan make a really good heel. And he's not much on the mic, so maybe if they even move Corey Graves off the announce table and make Corey Graves his mouthpiece... I mean, Graves is good at announcing. I don't want to see him leave there, but I also think he's capable of more. And if they gave him an extended role, I think that would be fine. Maybe he could even go old school. Remember, Bobby Heenan and a lot of other managers used to do commentary every week on WWE TV while managing other talent. So Corey Graves could pull double duty. Who knows? And maybe I'm even mentioning Corey Graves' name for no reason. I just think that he's involved in this somehow. And Corey Graves can talk, and he's got charisma. And I think if he was a mouthpiece type of guy for Jason Jordan, it would be an odd pairing. Uh, I'm not sure if they really match, but you know, for him to be able to talk a little bit more for Jason Jordan, get him over, become a heel, 
feel. As easy it is to like Corey Graves, it's really easy to hate him too. So I think Corey Graves can go in either direction there. I think uh, that could make for some really good TV. So we'll, we'll see what they do. But right now it looks like The Miz is going to be the first person on Jason Jordan's hit list, and that's fine. If he wins the IC belt, that's good. Let's get him off and running. Let's start building this character and building this run and this legacy on Raw. And eventually, hopefully, this storyline will pay off in a huge way. Now I'll talk about that main event that I just mentioned. It was Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose taking on the entire Miz Taraj. This match was announced last week, and it was the main event of Raw. And last week, and all during this past week's Monday Night Raw, Dean Ambrose seems to have trust issues with Seth Rollins. He does not trust Seth because of what Seth did when he broke up the Shield back in 2014. They did the promo last week on Raw. This week, there was a backstage segment where Dean is really not into being Seth's partner. Seth approached him and says, hey, this is the first time we've teamed together in a long time. I'm kind of excited about it. And Dean's like, well, I'm not because I don't trust you. And you only have to worry about three guys out there. I have to worry about four and walks away. So I'm thinking in my head, man, they are really playing up this distrust of Seth Rollins by Dean Ambrose. It's probably going to be Dean to be the one to go heel. It's probably going to be Dean to get his revenge on Seth Rollins for what Seth did all those years ago. And he's going to turn on him in this match. And the Miz Taraj is going to wind up winning. But that didn't happen. It was actually a pretty good match. The two of them worked just as well as they did back in their Shield days, even did a few of their old Shield moves, and eventually wound up defeating the Miz Taraj. And how about Bo Dallas and Kurt Axel being in a main event match on Raw? How crazy is that to say in 2017? But Dean Ambrose and Seth, they kept it together, they got along, they worked together brilliantly, and they had a great match and defeated three guys and stood tall to close the show. Now, what I found interesting was that during the match, they cut backstage to Cesaro and Sheamus watching the match on the monitor. So now I'm like, oh shit, here I thought Seth Rollins was eventually going to face The Miz for the Intercontinental title. Looks like they've changed directions on that. Jason Jordan will be the one working with Miz, and Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins are probably going to work with Sheamus and Cesaro, which I think will make for some pretty interesting matches, because don't forget, Sheamus and Cesaro came together much the same way as Dean and Seth did. They were reluctant tag team partners. They didn't like each other at first. There were trust issues, but eventually they formed a cohesive unit. Now you got Seth and Dean doing the same thing, and that could be a good match. Seth and Dean versus Sheamus and Cesaro at SummerSlam. I think maybe they stretch out the inevitable heel turn by Dean Ambrose. I think that absolutely must happen. Because he hasn't been a heel yet, has he? Since uh, since the Shield broke up. He's been babyface the whole time. He's long overdue. And I think they can give Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose the titles and have them run for a little while and then have Dean Ambrose turn. Or you can do the turn at SummerSlam. That would be fine. So maybe they get a tag team title match, but they don't win the titles. Dean Ambrose ends up turning on Seth Rollins in the end. But I think if you're going to do the heel turn, you should probably have them win the belts. And maybe do the heel turn at a later time. Unless they took the belts from Sheamus and Cesaro on Raw, and then had a rematch at SummerSlam and dropped the belts back to Sheamus and Cesaro, and that's where you do the heel turn after the match. So I think eventually Dean's got to go heel here. I think this cohesiveness and this temporary alliance between the two is going to be just that. It's going to be temporary, but it does look like they're going to get a crack at the Raw Tag Team titles, most likely at SummerSlam. So I really have no issue with that either, especially if it leads to a Dean Ambrose heel turn. The only problem with the Dean Ambrose heel turn is that that means we get another program between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, and we've seen that a lot of times over the years. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword there, but think about this. Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins and Sheamus are all former WWE champions, so in a tag team title program, three out of the four guys have been world title holders before, and that's good for the tag team titles and their status on the brand. So I really have no issue with that potential match taking place at SummerSlam, and I hope it turns out to be good. That's really all I'm going to say about Monday Night Raw. The only other things I have jotted down, Nia Jax defeated Emma. She approached Kurt Angle backstage and was complaining about her opportunities. So Kurt Angle put her in a match with Nia Jax, and Nia squashed her at the end and hit her with like a senton bomb and just flattened poor Emma. I tweeted that it reminded me of when Earthquake uh, squashed Damien when he took Jake's snake and gave it the... uh, the earthquake bomb or whatever. I mean, that's what Emma looked like. She looked like a smushed Damien on the mat. That was a brutal match. And we had Tazawa and Neville having a brawl with each other. Davari came out there and kicked both their asses. So I guess they're trying to elevate Davari a little bit, and he might be getting some title matches in the future. And I have no clue what they're going to do with the Cruiserweight title at SummerSlam. But I'm very happy that my prediction came true. I said the day after that Neville won that Cruiserweight belt, that he should hold it at least until SummerSlam. And here we are. SummerSlam is here. Moving on to SmackDown now, boy, did they bounce back from Battleground. I think that they knew they had to. They had to give the fans a good show here, and they did. I was really happy with Raw and SmackDown this week. 
The show opened with the brand new United States champion Kevin Owens coming down to the ring. I was one of the only people to predict him to win back that title. The only thing I wasn't sure about is what they were going to do in the future with him and AJ and what they were going to be doing at SummerSlam. If they were actually going to stretch this out until the next pay-per-view and do one more big blow-off at SummerSlam. But I think we might have our answer to that and we got it on SmackDown tonight. Now he comes out and says that his open challenge will start next week, which really disappoints the fans. Oh, by the way, SmackDown was in Richmond, Virginia tonight. I have been to that arena so many times in my life. Back when I used to go to shows during the Attitude Era, I have seen a lot of great moments in that arena. And every time the WWE goes there, it brings a smile to my face because I have great memories traveling to Richmond when I used to live in North Carolina back in the day. But Owens is out there to say that his open challenge will start next week. AJ Styles comes out as predicted. We knew that he would. He wants his rematch right away. The two of them start jawing with each other. And then out of nowhere, Chris Jericho's music hits and he comes back. I loved that because I did not see See Chris Jericho coming back to the WWE coming. I knew we would probably see him again pretty soon, but I kind of thought it would be like after SummerSlam or something. So that was a really pleasant surprise to see Jericho come back out. The crowd popped so hard. I love returns like that. I love when you don't know they're happening. That is something that I could not have predicted. Nothing WWE did made me think that we could potentially see Chris Jericho come back. But he showed back up and uh, puts AJ Styles on the list for trying to cut in line and cut in front of him because Jericho is owed a rematch for the United States title as well. Shane McMahon comes out and makes the main event for later that night a triple threat match between Owens, Jericho, and AJ for the United States title. And that really pisses off Kevin Owens. He bitches to Shane McMahon backstage about it. And then we fast forward to the match, a really good match to close the show. And AJ won back the United States title, kind of stole a victory. Jericho got hit with the pop-up powerbomb and actually kicked out. And Kevin Owens went up to the top rope to hit the frog splash. All this time, AJ is on the outside of the ring. After the frog splash, he scurries back in, grabs Kevin Owens and throws him out and lays on top of Jericho for the pin, kind of stealing back the United States title. So in the blink of an eye, we have Kevin Owens as a three-time former United States champion and AJ Styles as a two-time United States champion. And they have announced a match next week because after the match was over, Owens gets on the on the mic and cuts a really angry promo blaming Shane McMahon and invokes his rematch clause for next week. So that's our answer. We're going to get this Kevin Owens and AJ Styles feud wrapped up on SmackDown instead of taking this into SummerSlam which is good. And now it's starting to look like we could actually see Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon potentially work SummerSlam. I think that's a really good possibility. I announced, or I had mentioned maybe a year ago, that I thought the two of them would make for good rivals or good opponents sometime in the future. And I saw a Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon match on the horizon at some point. But it kind of became something that I just forgot about. And now it looks like that might actually happen, especially next week if AJ retains, which I'm sure he will. Kevin Owens is going to be even that much more furious and he's going to blame Shane McMahon even more and eventually the two will come to blows and they could actually have a match at SummerSlam. So I'm fine with that. I'm sure the two of them will have some great build and the match will be very interesting. All of Shane McMahon's matches always are. Provided Shane doesn't win, if Shane works with Owens, if Shane works with anybody, he needs to lose every time. He can put up a great fight. He gave AJ a hell of a fight at WrestleMania. As long as he does the same thing to Kevin Owens but he doesn't win, I'm fine with it. I know Shane McMahon survived a helicopter crash and everything, but if he's going to be getting in the ring and he's going to be taking up big-time pay-per-view spots and matches, he at least needs to lose these matches, in my opinion. I guess AJ Styles, I can envision him retaining the title next week and then going into SummerSlam to face a completely different opponent for the title. Who that opponent is, I don't know. I'm kind of hoping it won't be Chris Jericho. If it's not Chris Jericho, who could it be? Could it be Shinsuke Nakamura? I don't know, because we have a really interesting match booked for next week. Jinder Mahal comes out to cut his celebratory victory promo on SmackDown, and he is out there to demand to know who his SummerSlam opponent is going to be. And during his promo, we hear the music, we knew it was going to happen, the horns, the sirens, all the shit, out comes John Cena. Big fucking surprise, we speculated on this for a long time that he would be the next guy to face Jinder Mahal. He comes out there, cuts a promo with Jinder, actually congratulates him on doing whatever it takes to retain the title, and he's in the best shape of his life and gives him a lot of props, but then also tells him that he's putting him on notice and that he's going to be the one to take the belt off of him at SummerSlam. 
which then prompts Daniel Bryan to come out and say, hold the phone, John Cena. I don't care if you're a 16-time world champion. You don't make the matches me and Shane McMahon do, so we're going to make a number one contenders match next week on SmackDown between you and Shinsuke Nakamura. Holy shit. And the winner will face Jinder Mahal at SummerSlam for the WWE title. So now what the hell are we going to see? John Cena versus Shinsuke? Well, if John Cena beats Shinsuke Nakamura, then he can go in and face AJ Styles for the U.S. belt at SummerSlam, and that's a match I would never complain about seeing. But I don't want to see Shinsuke get beat by John Cena on SmackDown. You know, I don't want to see John Cena beating anybody on SmackDown right now, especially newer guys that just got there that you're trying to establish that you would like to give world title matches to in the future. The last thing I want to see next week on SmackDown is John Cena AA and pin Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, I'm interested in the match, because it's a first-time ever match, and you've got the, one of the biggest stars in Japan ever taking on one of the biggest stars in WWE ever, and that's pretty awesome. But if that match ends with a fucking attitude adjustment and a victory for John Cena, I might have a heart attack. So what I'm hoping is one of two things happens. John Cena either puts over Shinsuke, and Shinsuke Nakamura goes into SummerSlam to face Jinder Mahal, or they do a non-finish and we get a triple threat for the title at SummerSlam between Jinder, Shinsuke, and Cena. The only problem with that is now you got both world titles being defended in multi-man matches. So I kind of think one of those titles needs to have a one-on-one -on -one match. So I'm a little bit nervous. I'm really intrigued, and I'm excited to see Cena versus Shinsuke. It's just a match that my eyeballs have never witnessed, so I would like to see it. But I'm really concerned about what they're going to do with Cena. It's just, if you're going to beat Shinsuke, has he lost yet? You guys, I don't even fucking know. I don't think he really has in WWE, right? So if you're going to beat him clean for the first time, do you have to have Cena do it? Fuck. So one can only assume that this match will be the main event next week, although we also have a United States title match as well, so who knows what they're going to do. But as far as SummerSlam goes, as much as I hate to say it, and as much as I don't want to see Cena beat Shinsuke next week, he seems like the more likely opponent for Jinder because of what Jinder's been trying to preach and, you know, his heritage and all that. And WWE had that very patriotic-themed battleground, and to have a United States guy going in there to face a guy from India would be just what WWE wants for storyline. If you put Shinsuke in there against uh, Jinder, it's a match that I have no problem with. I would love to see Shinsuke win and get that opportunity. It's just not a match I think we're going to see, because Jinder can't do any of his shtick with Shinsuke, like he can with Randy Orton or John Cena, and talk about America and how everybody hates him. What the hell is he going to talk about in promos with Shinsuke Nakamura? Talk about how bad the Japanese audience hates him or something? I don't know. So I find the match between Cena and Shinsuke intriguing and perplexing all at the same time. So right now, I'm not really sure what they're going to do. Whatever it is, I think John Cena finds his way into a title match at SummerSlam, whether it be one-on-one, -on -one, whether it be triple threat. And don't forget, John Cena and Roman Reigns are both going to be in the same building at SummerSlam. They have been teasing shit on Twitter for a while now. We know that match must happen at some point. Probably WrestleMania. Some of us speculated that it could happen as early as SummerSlam. Clearly, that's not going to happen now. But maybe they're building this for WrestleMania. Maybe they're even building this for Survivor Series. Because remember, last year, we got that big match between Brock and Goldberg at Survivor Series. Survivor Series is a big four pay-per-view that has really sucked in recent years. And last year, it looked like they were trying to turn things around, giving fans a big-time marquee match. So Cena versus Roman at Survivor Series, I think would even be better than holding it off until WrestleMania. So maybe there's a run-in on one of these sides here. Maybe Cena interferes in the Fatal 4-Way. Maybe Roman interferes in Cena's match. I don't know what the motivation would be for either one of those two guys to interfere in the other one's matches, but maybe one of them has something to do with the other one losing, and they can build the confrontation from there. But then you got a lot of time before Survivor Series, a lot of time to kill. I don't know what they would do in between, but it is a possibility for the two of them to have some sort of a confrontation at SummerSlam. Or they can both have their matches, go their own separate ways, and continue to talk trash to each other on Twitter. Because one of the things that Roman Reigns said is that he was criticizing Battleground and the crowd in Philadelphia for being dead and quiet. And there was even some rumors that a lot of them were leaving early during the Punjabi prison match because they couldn't see or whatever. And the crowd was just really, really dead in Philly. That's the same building that Roman Reigns won the Royal Rumble and got booed out of the building. And John Cena tweets back at him like, easy young fella, you know, pride comes before the fall. And then Roman Reigns says, you know where to find me, you know where my yard is. So they're teasing some shit there. So it's definitely a feud and a program that's inevitable. It's just at this point, I don't know when it's going to happen. And Roman Reigns is right, though. You know, I, I mentioned this on Twitter 
earlier on on Monday before Raw because a lot of people were comparing the shitty finish to Battleground to the shitty finish of the Royal Rumble 2015, both in the same building. And to me, I think they're completely different. Don't get me wrong, they both sucked. They both sucked two gigantic, hairy, sweaty balls. I will not deny that. But one sucked in a completely different way because look at the finishes of those two matches. At Battleground, you had Great Khali showing up, returning to the WWE, helping Jinder retain the WWE title, and the crowd was completely silent because they did not give a shit. Where at the Royal Rumble 2015 when Roman Reigns won and The Rock came out and all of that, they nearly rioted. They were the opposite of quiet. They were the opposite of bored. They were the opposite of dead. They wanted to tear that place apart and burn it to the fucking ground. They were so pissed off that Roman Reigns won. And that's why sometimes I tell people I don't think they quite get the whole Roman Reigns thing, WWE isn't going to change much about him when he gets that type of reaction, when he gets that type of heat. It's ass backwards, I know that, but wrestling's ass backwards in general in today's day and age because the fans know everything, it's so overexposed. So it's like a reverse heel. You know, in astronomy, physicists have just recently, in the last couple of decades, discovered dark matter, this substance that's completely opposite of regular matter, but it exists and they don't even know why. I know that's a strange analogy to make, but guys like Roman Reigns and John Cena generate the opposite reaction from the crowd than they would, say, if this was the 1980s. They are the standard good guys, the standard baby faces, and the fans just puke at them. But it's not like the fans don't care. I mean, they sing John Cena sucks to the tune of his theme song. 20,000 people at every show doing that shit. Is anybody doing that for gender? Was anybody rioting for gender Mahal? Was anybody booing the finish out of the building? Was anybody going on YouTube and screaming at the top of their lungs into their camera after that finish? No, because nobody gave a shit. With guys like Roman Reigns and John Cena, everybody gives a shit. So when WWE sees the fans damn near rioting over a Roman Reigns victory, that doesn't mean they're doing something wrong. That means they're doing something right. I know that's ass backwards and unorthodox, but I also believe that the louder fans booed John Cena, the less likely it was that he was ever going to turn heel. The only way a guy like John Cena was going to turn heel is if the fans treated him like Jinder Mahal. And when he came out to the ring, he got no reaction. The fans reacted to nothing he said. They didn't sing during his theme song. They simply didn't give a fuck. If that was the deal with Cena, then he would have been a heel ten fucking years ago. And that was the point I was trying to make when I was tweeting on Monday, is that there's just a difference. There is a big difference between the two finishes. And everybody out there that hates Roman Reigns, you don't hate Jinder Mahal the way you hate Roman Reigns. You are vocal about it. You are passionate about it. If you go to a show, you are going to scream, I hate you, Roman Reigns, at the top of your lungs. But you are never going to do that for Jinder Mahal. That's the difference between being truly boring and just saying somebody is boring when they're really not. Because you wouldn't be screaming this loud at somebody if they were really that boring. Roman Reigns is boring as fuck on the mic. John Cena is lame as fuck on the mic. But you know what? Both guys can have awesome matches with just about anybody, and that's proven. You can just go on pay-per-view and watch that and see for yourself. WWE should only change something if it's not working. If you have every single fan in that arena reacting to you, whether it's positive or negative, that means it's working. Jinder Mahal is not getting that reaction from the fans at all. Not even close. Speaking of Shinsuke Nakamura, incidentally, he did get a big victory on SmackDown, defeating Baron Corbin in their rematch. Baron Corbin uh, hit him with a low blow at Battleground and got DQ'd. So they had their rematch there, and Nakamura beat him with his uh, finisher knee strike thing. And, of course, Daniel Bryan awarded him a number one contenders match next week against John Cena, which should, like I said, be extremely interesting to see. And don't let all that John Cena talk just a minute ago make you forget that I also said that I really, really, really do not want him to defeat Nakamura next week, and he better fucking not. We had some women's tag team action as well on SmackDown. Charlotte and Becky defeated Tamina and Lana. Tamina looked pretty pissed off at Lana after the match, walked away. I don't know what's going on between these two. Uh, at one point, it looks like Tamina is going to be her protector, her bodyguard. Now she's pissed at her and looks like she could turn on her at any second. Uh, we had Aiden English and Mike Bennett losing to Ty Dillinger and Sami Zayn. And what's funny is that you notice that nobody interrupts Aiden English when he sings. Over on Raw, every single time the drifter is in the ring, some asshole interrupts his song. But on SmackDown, nobody does that to Aiden English. It's just kind of funny how that works out. The drifter should text Aiden English and ask him what his secret is to preventing guys from coming out and fucking up his songs. And the only other thing I'll mention about SmackDown is the segment between the Usos and the New Day. 
The New Day was set to come out there to have their victory promo on SmackDown, and during Big E's big introduction from behind the curtain, they're attacked. I don't know if anybody has ever attacked New Day in the middle of that before. That was pretty good. You heard a loud noise, and the mic kind of hit the floor. Next thing you know, the Usos are dragging the New Day out to the stage and beating the shit out of them, and left all three of them laying. So that's kind of cool. I didn't want to see this issue between the two of them over quite yet. I don't know if they're going to wrap up business in this feud on SmackDown or if they're going to carry this in and do one more match at SummerSlam with some sort of a stipulation. But the match between the two teams at Battleground was fantastic, so I'm definitely not going to complain if they do one more match at SummerSlam for the blow-off. So there you go. There you have it. That's pretty much your Raw and SmackDown in a nutshell there. And if there's anything significant that I forgot to talk about, please forgive me. And please forget this abrupt closing here. I just want to get out of here because somebody outside is using a fucking jackhammer. Hopefully my noise reduction will eliminate that, but I don't want to talk too long here with that shit going on in the background. So you guys have a great rest of your week. As of right now, I'll be up here next week with my normal commentary, Raw and SmackDown review. So hopefully you will hear from me very soon. If not, I'll catch you next week for episode 447. You guys take care, and I'll talk to you next week. Until next time, peace. (laughs) 